Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here today. I'm going to talk to you about making phenomics a first class computational act. Um, and this is work that has been done by very, very many people. Um, and you can find these slides for links uh, and additional information at the bit.ly shown below. So when my child was four years old, he said, Mama, people are a lot like dogs. And I said, yes, Sam, indeed, they are. And really, um, what I spent the next you know, many weeks explaining to my four-year-old was all about evolutionary biology and how we learn different things from different organisms. And in the context of understanding genomics, um, how there's a great need to understand the, the variability in phenotypic features that are the outcomes of genomic variability, and how can we use this information to interpret the genome for purposes such as diagnostics, mechanism discovery, risk assessment, and many other things. So other species aren't just relevant. Each one has specific, unique phenotypes that tell us something about the way in which the genome works. The dog's retina has the area centralis, which is analogous to the human macula and fovea-like region, um, which is useful to study naturally occurring cone diseases. Aged cats are natural models of Alzheimer's disease. They form neurofibrillary tangles and have neuronal loss that's very similar. Naked mole rats don't get cancer. Why is that? Armadillos are a natural host of leprosy, the mycobacterium that causes leprosy and the only one besides humans. Tree shrews, glioblastomas are morphologically and genetically similar to humans and more similar than those of the mouse models. Great pond snails are models of inflammation-mediated memory dysfunction and show evidence of spontaneous neural tissue regeneration after injury. Silkworms are a model for uric acid metabolism, and uh, plas decreases in plasma uric acid are correlated with clinical progression of Parkinson's disease. And the list goes on and on and on. So how can we actually take advantage of understanding this, you know, what Mother Nature has allowed us to understand about the variation in the genome and how it relates to phenotypic outcomes as presented in this diversity of species? In order to do that, we need to do what we call crossing the chasm of semantic despair, as coined by my favorite colleague, Dr. Chris Shute. And what this means is that when we think about understanding basic research data and how we describe the phenotypic features and the genetic features and the mechanistic um, research that we perform over there on the left uh, in terms of basic research science, genomics, proteomics, met metabolomics, molecular modeling, cellular models, and many assays, those data are fundamentally not very interoperable with what we understand about the clinical um, data and presentation of patients in a clinical setting, which where we have trials and laboratory data and medical imaging and the electronic health record. In order to cross the chasm of semantic despair, and yes, that is indeed me at the bottom of the chasm, we have data, ontologies, tools, standards, and clinical delivery. And really, this talk is about how do we put all of those things together to leverage those many different organismal traits to help us understand human disease. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the Human Phenotype Ontology, which was founded by my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Robinson, uh, and has been a component of the Monarch Initiative for over 10 years. This ontology is a graph structure. Um, it consists of, of, of over 14,000 terms uh, that are similar to a clinical terminology, but unlike most clinical terminologies that are designed for billing and quality of care types of purposes, this, ontology, this terminology is a, is a true ontology in the a sense that has both logical and textual definitions for its terms. And those logical definitions allow the relationship to other key ontologies, such as the gene ontology, which many of you may be familiar with. So for example, the human phenotype ontology term hyposmia is actually de de logically defined in terms of its relationship to the gene ontology term sensory perception of smell, which at the time of my query had over 34,000 annotations from 22 species. So if we think about the capabilities of describing human features using an ontology that's, that's born interoperable with the same kinds of resources that we use to do mechanistic research, such as the gene ontology across many species, all of a sudden we have the possibility of crossing that chasm, that semantic chasm of despair. So how do we actually use the human phenotype ontology? And this is a, um, a real example from a clinic in Berlin where 
um, uh, two patients came into the clinic within a few weeks of each other. They're unrelated patients, a three-year-old girl on the left and a 14-year-old boy. And the human phenotype ontology was used to describe their particular phenotypic characteristics, such as cone-shaped epiphysis of the phalanges of the hand or uh, microcephaly on the left, uh, whereas the 14-year-old boy had a different um, kind of suite of features, such as long toe and macrocephaly. Well, we have a number of gold standards that the Monarch Initiative has created for each known disease. Here in the middle, shown in blue, is Weidemann Steiner syndrome profile, which is a collection of phenotypic features encoded using the human phenotype ontology and using a semantic similarity algorithm that compares the set of features described for each patient, we can find the most similar set of features in the graph to the known sets of features that are associated with, with uh, human diseases such as Weidemann Steiner syndrome. And what you'll see here is that these two patients who were both diagnosed with Weidemann Steiner syndrome but have a different variant uh, in the same gene, KMT2A, um, which really gets after the fact is there are these two subtypes of Weidemann Steiner syndrome, but, but nevertheless, um, it allowed us to pinpoint what was the causal variant for each of these patients. You'll see that some of these um, phenotypic features are, are identical, such as microcephaly for the girl matching the Weidemann Steiner syndrome uh, gold standard profile, whereas the 14-year-old boy had macrocephaly, an opposite phenotype. Similarly, the long toe uh, for the 14-year-old boy is the opposite phenotype. In the graph, these are siblings. Short toes and long toes are very much related um, as siblings in the human phenotype ontology graph. And so they are fuzzy, fuzzily matched, if you will, to the Weidemann Steiner syndrome profile. Using this type of approach in combination with genomic analysis can be extremely powerful to improve the diagnostic rate and identify causal variants. I wanted to speak a little bit about, um, oops. A little bit about um, those that, that Weidemann Steiner syndrome uh, disease entity. So we have found that in trying to create um, all of these disease profiles, that it has been very challenging because different disease information exists in different places, and they're not very interoperable. So, for example, there's a set of disease resources shown on the left: OMIM, Orphanet, NCIT, Guard, EFO, DO, Mesh, Medic, and many, many others. And so what we did was we created uh, a algorithm called KBOOM that was developed by my colleague Chris Mungle at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab called the Bayesian Owl Ontology Merging Algorithm. Um, we just like to say KBOOM. Um, and in this context, it takes all these different terminologies and using a logical and probabilistic inferencing strategy creates a set of candidate cliques of equivalency. So how do we know if a term from the NCIT or the Guard are actually equivalent? We use a lot of information from the graph, we use string matching, we use cross-references, we use synonyms, and just general characteristics um, of the different sources. For example, OMIM, which consists mostly of leaf nodes um, or individual diseases. And in this process, we take the ones that have low probability and we curate them. In many such cases, there are errors in the source ontology. So for example, in MeSH, we found a whole branch that was duplicated with Roman numerals and alphanumerics um, representing the same diseases, and we're able to give that back to the NLM for, for fixing. Those all then go back into the equivalence um, uh, relations into the ontology that results, which is called MONDO, which means for the world. So this is an effort that aims to, to um, harmonize and create equivalencies across all of the uh, in particular, genetic disease resources, though it is in no way limited to genetic diseases. So thinking about the context of, of variant prioritization and diagnostics, we actually looked at the different sources that are used for rare diseases. Um, and there have been a number uh, described around 7,000 rare diseases since the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. Um, and nobody's really updated that number since then. So in order to examine this, we looked at the top five most widely used um, sources that have rare disease information in them and found that um, when we actually do the counting, we see that um, within these five sources, we have over 10,000 unique rare disease concepts. And what was really interesting is that the majority of them are only in one source and only 333 disease concepts were in all five sources. So it really speaks to the great need to harmonize these disease resources in order to come up with gold standard profiles that can be used in the computational settings where these different disease resources might be used to give every patient anywhere they might live around the world an equal chance 
of identifying a diagnosis. So why model organisms matter to patients? Well, as it turns out, um, if we take the 19,000 plus um, human coding genes, um, we find that only approximately 4,000 of those genes have causal variations associated with phenotypic outcomes. That's actually a pretty poor number, um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Understanding causality in humans is really hard since they are not necessarily the most amenable model organism. <laughs> Um, when we take those 19,000 um, genes and we look at the orthologs of those genes in the top five most commonly utilized model organisms, such as yeast, worm, fly, zebrafish, and mouse, we actually have 16,000 of those genes have causal variations uh, associated with phenotypic outcomes. If we take the union of those, we actually get approximately 84% coverage of understanding um, causal variation outcomes. Uh, on the phenotypic um, uh, presentation uh, for these 19,000 19, genes. That's a huge amount of data that's present in the model organisms that can be used to help infer um, and prioritize variants coming from uh, um, diagnostic settings. But one of the problems is, is that um, we don't really speak the same language. So for example, palmoplantar hyperkeratosis might be a clinical term, and the computer really has no idea what this means. Further, when we actually look at similar phenotypes in the mouse, it might be referred to as ulcerated paws, whereas a patient might refer to it as having thick hand skin. And so in the context of trying to create this interoperability in terms of the phenotypic features across species, we have a really um, challenging problem here. It is not simply a text matching problem, it's a conceptual alignment problem. So what we've done in order to do, to try to, to try to address this is coming back to that original um, axiomatization with the human phenotype ontology. Similarly here, we can take the term from the human phenotype ontology, palmoplantar hyperkeratosis, and decompose that into a logical definition using species neutral ontologies, such as the gene ontology, the Uberon anatomy ontology. And here we say, for example, that there's an increased keratinization of the stratum corneum layer of the skin in the autopod. And then when we see that same or similar, semantically similar set of, of axioms for a term such as ulcerated pause, we know that these two terms are now similar. And I say similar because we're not necessarily suggesting that it is an identical phenotype in these two species, but rather that the way in which the biology dictates that it is described is similar enough that they may be related enough to help us understand how to do that fuzzy matching across species as well as uh, directly within humans using the human phenotype ontology as I showed earlier. So one of the keys to both the gene ontologies, um, species neutrality, as well as our work on these cross-species phenotypes is the Uberon anatomy ontology. You can go to uberon.org and learn more, but essentially it's a knowledge graph that, that represents a species neutral um, anatomical uh, set of, of terms that are defined developmentally and has developmental staging for um, different taxa. It has taxon constraints. And it can, um, it can basically uh, reconcile, similar to how we did with Mondo, the different anatomy terminologies that exist across species in a species neutral manner. And you can slice and dice the graph to whatever um, domain you wish, if you're interested in mammals or if you're interested in the brain, for example. And this puts it all together. So if we think about the gene ontology as representing gene function, the euphino or uberphino, and we do like our ubers uh, in the Monarch Initiative, is really the consequences of gene dysfunction. And it's based foundationally on uberon, the cell ontology, and other species neutral ontologies that help us describe variation in form and function, uh, as well as uh, all the way, as well as development and cellular phenotypic features. So putting it all together, uh, we have a tool uh, called Eximizer, which is led by Damien Smedley um, uh, at, uh, uh, at Genomics England. And this, this tool takes all these things and puts them together. So over there on the left, we have our, um, our genomic information in blue, and, in the, and on the right, we have our, our phenotypic information in green. And what's really important to think about here is it's, we take the information about the patient, a VCF file for the genomic information and a HPO file uh, for the patient phenotypic features. And together, those are compared against reference information and algorithmically assessed. So for the variant information, we might 
remove off-target variants, common variants, benign variants, um, you might um, create pathogenicity um, characteristics, and filter down those, those, those candidate variants that the patient may have based upon a variety of modern um, algorithmic analyses. But the important part that we bring to the table here is the use of the phenotypic features to actually help, because after um, doing the variant filtering, there are still many hundreds of candidate variants left. So how can we further prioritize those variants using the phenotypic features and the cross-species information that I showed you earlier? Uh, we also use a guilt by association protein-protein interaction network uh, to try to also help prioritize um, variants based on phenotypic similarity to protein-protein interaction partners. And so by creating those phenotypic similarities, similar to, I, to what I showed you for weidemann steiner syndrome, but also using a cross-species approach and that protein-protein interaction network, we can actually help further reduce the number of prioritized genes, hopefully into, into the identifi identification of finding the causal variant. So this is an example of that. Um, this is a, a patient seen in Genomics England. Her name is Jessica. She has over 6 million variants in her genome, with 677,000 being rare, 2,800 predicted to cause a change in a protein, and 67 were different to her parents. In this case, she, uh, her, her condition was that she had epilepsy affecting her movement and developmental delay, and all of the standard tests were negative. Um, using this type of approach, we were able to show that the SLC2A1 gene was identified as the cause of her GLUT1 deficiency syndrome, and the tool Examizer ranked this variant as first. The nice thing about this story is it's, it's really a wonderful outcome because this particular condition can be fully treated with a ketogenic low-carb diet and provides a low risk for future pregnancy so this family can, can have additional children if they wish. The other exciting thing about using this cross-species approach is that we can identify new candidate genes using model organisms as well. And so this is an example um, that we collaborated on with the IMPC where we were able to identify um, 135 new candidate genes for Mendelian disorders that are described in OMIM for which we did not have a causal variant uh, or causal mechanism already identified. So this is just one of those 135 examples from this manuscript showing a new model for diamond black fan, black fan anemia where the phenotypic profile similarity for increased mean corpuscular hemoglobin and decreased erythrocyte cell numbers allowed us to do that fuzzy phenotypic matching um, and combined uh, um, and, and it shows that this, this variation may actually account for as many as 46% of the people that have diamond black fan, black fan anemia with otherwise unknown genetic causes. So for you bioinformatics um, fans in the audience, I wanted to pro provide a little bit more information about our data resources. So all of the information about uh, anatomy and phenotypes and cross-species information and genotype phenotype associations and phenotype disease associations is all um, put into a knowledge graph. Um, and we have um, quite a lot of gene to phenotype associations from over 50 species. Um, and we love to collect new species. So if you have data for a species of, of interest, we'd be happy to integrate it and include it. Um, we have things as diverse as the American mink and the platypus. We have uh, over 9,000 gene to disease associations and 30,000 non-causal gene to disease associations from more than 70 species. Using ontologies and semantic engineering, we have a way of combining all of this information about diseases, phenotypes, anatomy, genetics, subcellular anatomy and gene functions. Um, and you can access these data through our API, and there's lots of um, data reports and, and um, data that can be downloaded at that other link there for uh, the Monarch data. So you can explore this knowledge graph on our website at monarchinitiative.org, um, and this just shows a few screenshots of a disease that our graduate student is working on, endometriosis, where you can um, see the, you know, the sort of presentation of that graph structure for phenotypes and genotypes that are associated with endometriosis, and then navigate to those um, phenotypes, uh, identifying models of the, that disease. Um, you can also search for a given profile. So you can take a set of your own phenotypes or generate a set based upon um, a known disease or a known uh, model, and then use that set of phenotypes to do what we call that fuzzy um, phenotype profile matching that I showed you for Weidemann Steiner syndrome. Um, we have a tool called the PhenoGrid, which allows the display of the similarity of those phenotypic features. So here, for example, um, we have our information about our 
um, or disease of interest that has umbilical hernia, um, hydrourea, ureter, facial asymmetry um, as the query, and then we can show which mouse genes have the phenotypic features that are most similar um, to those uh, that set of um, query phenotypes. And the darker the square, the more similar um, that particular phenotypic feature are. And when you're in the um, system, you can actually hover over and it will show you what the match actually is. Um, this is also available via API and is really useful for bioinformatics applications. So the takeaways are that semantics can help cross the chasm of semantic despair and support more meaningful patient classification. Realizing standardized and computable phenotypic data akin to genomic data has revolutionized diagnostics and discovery. The dynamic interplay between public data and clinical and patient level data is really critical to diagnostics and to the goal of precision medicine. Finally, combining clinical and basic research data supports new hypotheses, mechanism discovery, and better treatment management. So I wanted to thank the very many people and the very many data sources. Um, first of all, uh, Peter Robinson, Chris Mungle, Damian Smedley, and David Osumi Sutherland, who have co-led the Monarch Initiative with me uh, for, I think, 12, 12 years now that we've had our funding from the NIH Office of Director. Um, and more recently, I'd also like to thank the NIH GRI, uh, who has provided us a Center of Excellence in Genomic Sciences for uh, a program called Phenomics First, which really focuses on Eufino um, uh, and Mondo in particular. And then finally, I'd like to thank all of the very many data sources. We are quintessential research data parasites and really work hard with our, our data providing partners to help make the data um, better and more useful for everyone in all the contexts and really love um, to provide feedback to the sources so that their communities can also benefit from our integrative work. Uh, so thanks very much, and I look forward to taking some questions.